Hello and welcome to our new autumn Bible study of 1 Peter at Christ Church in Tyler, Texas. 1 Peter is one of the most powerful books in all the Bible, and it'll be a joy for us to walk through this letter this autumn together. I'm David Luckenbach, and I'll be your host today. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you inspired many many centuries ago, Lord, with your word. And that word has been passed down to us as holy writ. We pray, Lord, that as we, as we hear and reflect and study and read First Peter once again, that you would use this as a text to deepen our faith, to minister to our souls, and to strengthen our relationship with Jesus. We pray all this gratefully in his name. Amen. So what is 1 Peter? We begin by considering who is Peter. The letter begins simply 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now we know who this is because we know the history of the church from the New Testament. There's only one Peter that's mentioned in all the New Testament, and it's a man whose given name was Simon. Simon was a fisherman. Simon is the brother of Andrew, also a fisherman from the Sea of Galilee, a little fishing town right there on the Sea of Galilee. And Simon and his brother Andrew were approached by Jesus, who invited them to put down their nets and follow him. And he said, I will make you fishers of men. And then Simon did. He put down his nets. He, if you will, he left his work as a fisherman to follow Jesus. Jesus later is going to change his name. He gives him really something of a nickname. His name is still Simon, of course, but Jesus nicknames him Petras. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. It's sort of a play on words. The name Petras means rock or rocky. And so there's always Two ways we can think of, of this name for Peter, and perhaps both were true, that Jesus describes him as the rock as, as in foundation on which he would build a church. But also, you know, sometimes Peter, Peter puts his foot in his mouth. Sometimes Peter, Peter misspeaks. Sometimes Peter makes some real mistakes that are, that are notable and mentioned um, throughout the Gospels and in the book of Acts. And so some have joked that it's also fair at times to think of Peter as rocky as well as the rock. Nevertheless, Peter is one of the essential leaders in the history of the church. Jesus named him the rock on whom he will build the church, and obviously Peter has played an essential role in the work of the church for 2,000 years. We know who Peter was from the Gospels, that Peter was a part of the inner circle, if you will, of Jesus. Not only was he one of the 12 apostles, but also there's a small group among the apostles that from time to time Jesus spent extra time with. And most famously, there's a small group whom Jesus took with him up the Mount of Transfiguration, and included in that small group was Peter. So Peter saw Jesus transformed. He, he literally saw Jesus in glory. He had a vision of Jesus that made it crystal clear to him that Jesus was more than a rabbi from Nazareth, but was the Messiah, was, was God incarnate. And Jesus, in, in fact, Peter is the one who professed who Jesus was. Jesus says, who do people say that I am, but who do you say that I am? And, and it's Peter who says, you are the Messiah. So Peter plays a role as an early leader of the apostles. It's important to mention that, you know, church history has, in some quarters, named him as the leader of the apostles. That's not completely accurate. That the apostles, if you will, they don't have a president. Um, they don't have a king. And so you see Peter play a role as a leader um, throughout the New Testament. You see 
Um, you see Peter throughout the New Testament, especially in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. But Acts chapter 15 describes this interesting scene of, um, of Jesus, uh, uh, not of Jesus, of, of Paul addressing the council at Jerusalem. And, and Peter is there and Peter plays a role, but Peter is not the essential leader. Uh, of the apostles in Acts chapter 15 in Jerusalem. He's not. Others are. Uh, Peter is, is a key leader, but he's not, if you will, a pope at all. So a little bit about that story. Galatians chapter 2 really does give something of an insight into that scene that's recorded in Acts chapter 15 of the Council of Jerusalem. It says, this is Paul writing to the Galatian church. Remember, Galatia is in what was then called Asia Minor, what is now modern Turkey. And Paul writes to the church, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, another early church leader, taking Titus, one of the young um, uh, uh, disciples, if you will, of Jesus, who, who follows uh, uh, Paul, who is an assistant to Paul taking Titus along with me. Um, and when those who were influential, i.e. the influential apostles, saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that's non-Gentiles, that's non-Jewish people, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, i.e. underscoring the leadership role of Peter, especially to the church in Judea. Judea is the name at that time of the Roman province um, where Pontius Pilate uh, exercised uh, a rule on behalf of Caesar. Um, uh, uh, what we now think of as Israel was then called Judea. Just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, a Peter plays this essential role of leadership uh, over the church among the Jewish people. For he, he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised also worked through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, Cephas also is a name for Peter, same person, and John, who seem to be pillars, I, these are the essential leaders of the early church, John, the author of the Gospel of John, uh, we believe also the author of the book of Revelation, and James, who's the brother of Jesus, and also the author of the epistle of James. When James and Cephas, that's Simon Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So we, we learn a little bit about who Peter is as a leader, but we also get an insight into his ministry, that it, a key part of the ministry of Peter that's described in the Gospels themselves, in the book of Acts, and certainly in Galatians 2, is that Peter plays this essential role of being an apostle to Jewish believers. However, however, first Peter is addressed to a church that's filled certainly with Jewish believers, but it's not addressed to the church in Judea. First Peter is not addressed to church in what is now called Israel. First Peter is actually addressed to a church of the dispersion. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, apostle means apostolos, one who is sent, one who is sent by Christ for Christ, to those who are elect exiles, elect exiles can refer to Jewish people as the elect of God, but it can also refer to any Christian. Throughout the New Testament, the elect is a word that's used of anybody who is in Christ. So to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, what does that mean? Well. This description, exiles of the dispersion, refers to um, a historical uh, series of events that we call the Jewish diaspora. 
So the Jewish diaspora of the first century was a dispersion of Jewish people from Israel throughout the Roman world. And so this map sort of um, uh, paints a picture of some of those other places where the Jewish people went from Antioch to Iconium, um, to Philadelphia, to Sardis, to Thyatria, um, uh, to Corinth, to Athens, to Rome, to Philippi, to Thessalonica, to Alexandria. These are, these are communities of Jews outside of Israel. Remember that at this time in history, in the first century, that Israel had not been an autonomous nation state, self-governing and all the rest for, you know, well over 400 years. Not since Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem four centuries before the incarnation of Jesus. And so, you know, as a conquered people who've been conquered and reconquered, the Babylonians and then the Persians, and then the Greeks and now the Romans, there are many Jewish people who had left Jerusalem, who had left, if you will, Israel and traveled to other places because they found a better life outside of Israel. So this is a letter that is addressed to members of the Jewish diaspora. Where? Where does it say? Look at the name of these towns. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All of these places are places that are in what was then called Asia Minor, what is now called Turkey. And most of these places are communities, Jewish communities in Asia Minor, um, but they're not Jewish towns. They're Gentile towns that have Jewish communities within them. Many of these places border the Black Sea in what it, we would describe now as northern Turkey, right on the Black Sea. Um, there, it's north and west of the Taurus Mountains. We also know a little bit about this part of the world and Peter's, uh, uh, Peter and Paul's role there. We, we don't have any reason to believe that Peter ever traveled to these towns to do ministry. We, we don't have evidence that Peter founded these churches at all. And we also know that the Apostle Paul did not go to these towns to evangelize. Acts chapter 16 sort of gives a summary of places that he went and didn't go, and, and these places are not places on the list. He did not travel Paul to these places to carry the gospel. He went to other places. And so it is a curious thing that these are the communities that are receiving this letter. And I think it does speak to the role that Peter did play in the first century church as a leader even beyond Judea. That he is not, if you will, a pope. The, the, the idea of a pope of the first bishop is, a, is an invention, a development that occurs some centuries after First Peter is written, and yet Peter is clearly the rock on whom Christ would build the church. He plays an essential role as an essential leader in the life of the early church, and his influence as a leader extends well beyond the Jewish community in Jerusalem. That when Peter is writing a letter to these Jewish communities, these Jewish Christian communities, and what is now Turkey, many, many, many weeks away by foot or camel or horse or donkey from Jerusalem, the Jewish community, the Jewish Christian communities presumably are taking this teaching seriously. And so it really does speak, I think, to the authority of St. Peter. So here's a little bit that describes some of these places you see where they're located. These are all in central and northern uh, Turkey, Asia Minor. And so these are not places that were uh, easily uh, traveled to. Uh, uh, nevertheless, these are, these are places that had a Jewish population, a Jewish diaspora population. And there's now these Jewish people that are believers that live in these communities. And so that's the heart of the addressee. However, 
would we argue that Peter is just addressing the Jewish members of these churches? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So in, in 1 Peter, we also learn really just by the, the existence of the letter itself and who it's being addressed to and who the author is, that Peter has a role of ministering to the whole church, even outside um, of the Jewish Christian community. He addresses the entire Christian community when he writes a letter that's addressed to the church in Cappadocia, in Bithynia, in Galatia. So a little bit about what Peter has to say. Peter has to say a lot. This is a powerful letter that's an encouraging letter to a church in difficult times. One theme in 1 Peter is that of eschatology. Eschatology is, is the study of the end times or the last days, the eschaton. And so Peter is going to speak of and allude to sort of the last days. He's going to offer a teaching about the return of Christ and, and what does the future hold for the church. I think more importantly for our purposes, though, one of the essential themes of First Peter is a theme of holiness. That Peter calls the church to live a life that is set apart. Remember, holiness, the word holiness means set apart for Christ. So he's calling the church both individually as believers and as a community to live a life that is set apart to bring glory to God. Another strong theme of First Peter is this theme of hope that he's encouraging the church to hold on to hope. What a wonderful word for us right now. I mean, as I record this for you, and as I share this introduction of First Peter with you here in Tyler, Texas, in uh, early mid-September of 2020, we could use a word of hope. It's helpful for us to be reminded that God has a word of hope for us. And so we're going to get it for these next weeks as we study together um, 1 Peter. 1 Peter also has a wonderful theme of salvation. That Peter is going to speak to what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be a believer? How are we saved? What does it mean to be saved? It's a strong theme here in 1 Peter, especially in chapter 2 and and one section in chapter three. Some other themes at First Peter that I think are really appropriate for our time are, he really does speak of community and the need for community and the value of community and the purpose of community and the worth of community throughout the letter from the second chapter to the fourth to the fifth. Again, Peter is going to come back to these themes of community in his letter. He also is gonna have an extensive teaching about living faithfully living as a Christian in the world, in the world. We're called, as you know, by Jesus to be in the world, but not of the world. We are embedded in the world. And so how do you live a faithful life in the midst of a world that is fallen, that is broken? The first Peter offers, I think, lots of great words and wisdom into how to faithfully live in the world. Also, First Peter is going to speak to the nature of God and to, the, and to God's will, this idea of providence and this idea of the will of God. These are strong themes that we're going to hear in First Peter. I think, again, that will really help us and strengthen our faith in the midst of these difficult days. And then finally, one reason that we are studying First Peter together that I think is very apropos is that a strong context and a theme of first peter is the theme of suffering that the churches in this part of asia minor the church we know in pontus and galatia and cappadocia and Bithynia, these are churches we know from history when this letter was written in the first century and then afterwards these were churches that went through a very very difficult time especially at the hands of the Roman authorities in those parts of the world. And so for you and I that are walking through a different time, a, a difficult time, difficult not because we're being persecuted by the state, but difficult because we're trying to walk our way through faithfully uh, in the midst of a pandemic. 
that I think that First Peter for us um, for these next few weeks is going to be a strong, encouraging word, and one that I think will profit us and strengthen our faith to meet this moment faithfully and to be encouraged by the word of God as we walk through uh, this time of trial of pandemic together. So as we begin the study of First Peter, together we can look forward to a number of weeks in which we're going to look together at a strong and encouraging word for a challenging time. First Peter indeed is a call to faith in a time of trial. And I very much look forward to walking through First Peter with you over these coming weeks. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the blessing of this day and the, the blessing we have of studying your word. We pray, God, that you would bless us as we explore First Peter together. We pray, Lord, that it would be for us an encouragement, that it would be for us a word that would strengthen our faith, that would deepen our faith, that would nurture us as we walk together through this time of trial. We continue to pray, Lord, for all those who are battling the coronavirus. We pray, Lord, for those who are working so hard to care for those that are sick. We pray that you would be with all of us as together we seek to faithfully follow Jesus in the midst of this time of trial. We pray all these things gratefully in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and we'll be with you next week.